Thank you, Debbie and Luther. Welcome to Wednesday at noon and uh, Parashat Re'e. Join me to say an opening bracha, which is our way of clearing the decks for the next little while. <clears throat> allowing all the other demands of our lives to recede for just this little bit of time <clears throat> and tune in here to our text and to each other. Let's say together, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kidshanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. Can somebody just unmute and say something for a second so I can make sure I can hear you? Yes. Well, Great. Good, good, good. Got it. Okay. All systems are working. That's always such a wonderful thing when that happens. Parashat Re'e. And as we've been doing each week, I do want to start with a look at the Haftarah for this week, this third week of comfort or consolation. So let me go ahead and open our source sheet for today. There. Can everyone see that? Actually, I think I can make it bigger. Can I? Yes. Uh, there. Visible? Yes? Okay. Okay, so the title will become clear as we move into the parasha. But for now, look with me at this absolutely gorgeous text from Isaiah. And what I've done this week is to put excerpts from two Haftarot in front of us because this Shabbat is Shabbat Rosh Chodesh. It's the beginning of the month of Elul. It's one of those two day Rashi Chodesh where it's Shabbat and Sunday. Uh, so this is by way of making um, an announcement and a reminder about a really wonderful program we're offering on Sunday, the 28th. Um, the morning starts at 9 a.m., inviting people to join me for some brief morning prayers and then a nosh. And then at 10 a.m., we're welcoming, here, I don't need to screen share while I tell you all of this. At 10 a.m., we're welcoming Rabbi Avi Straussberg, who is the local director of Hadar, for a shiur that she has prepared for us on awe and fear, two huge themes of the new year season. So if you haven't studied with her before, I really, really urge you to come and join. Audrey's affirming that. Uh, we are asking people to register. So if you go on the Adachalim website or go to your last, uh, Luther and Debbie have sent us reminders, etc. You can find it easily. Following Avi's Shior, Luther will offer a session on poetry tuned to the season. I'm offering a session that I've called the Women of Rosh Hashanah. And if you're not sure what that means, you'll have to come and find out. Uh, we have Naomi Weintraub, who's been like almost like a resident artist for us doing um, a creative session on holiday calendar making. And um, I think that's it for the morning. So please, if you haven't registered, come on over. Register and come on over. Okay. Back to Isaiah. So as I was explaining, this Shabbat is Shabbat Rosh Chodesh and then Sunday as well. Um, and because of that, as we'll see in a second, the Shabbat, uh, the third week of comfort Haftarah gets bumped so that we can read the, the Haftarah of Shabbat Rosh Chodesh. And that's what we're looking at right now. So the Shabbat, uh, the Haftarah for Shabbat Rosh Chodesh, also from Isaiah, and it has its own verse about the cycles of the moon, which is why it was chosen to read on Shabbat Rosh Chodesh. But what I've done here is pull out a verse that helps us stay connected to the seven weeks of comfort. So this is a, a verse, or I guess two verses, um, from the Haftarah for Shabbat Rosh Chodesh, which we'll hear this Shabbat in the voice of our be mitzvah, Sophia Daniel, uh, but, but helps us go, wait a minute, while these calendar things are, uh, you know, overlaying each other, we can stay connected 
to what I think is just such a wonderful practice of these seven weeks. So here's uh, Isaiah 66, verse 13. Ke'ish asher imo tenachamenu ken anochi anach chem chem uvirushalayim tenuchamu. So look at how many times in one sentence the root word for comfort comes up. One, here I'll try to highlight it if it'll let me. One, here's nechama, nechama. And the second one, and then here's the third one. And we can see what he's saying in the English. Ke'ish asher imo, like um, a man whose mother comforts her son, her, her child. Ken anochi anachem chem, so will I comfort you. I, God, will comfort you, children of Israel. Uvi Yerushalayim tenuchamu. And in fact, the whole, not only geographic entity of Jerusalem, but the idea of Jerusalem, which is, which is really an idea in Jewish tradition. It's not just a city or a geographical place, but uh, an aspiration as we talk about Yerushalayim shel mala, Yerushalayim shel mata, the, the idea of uh, an, a supernal Jerusalem, which is a place where the peace that is so elusive and, and impossible for us to reach, it feels, is possible. And uh, all of the, the vision that we have for humanity is possible to realize in that Yerushalayim shel mala, and then Yerushalayim shel mata is the one that's on the ground where we have to figure it out every day. Okay, so this is what Isaiah is saying to the exiles. And then just to finish this up, verse 14, Uritem v'sas libchem v'atzmotechem kadesha tifrachena. Tifrach, yeah, it's so beautiful. Uh, you will see, Uritem, you will come to see, v'sas libchem, your hearts rejoice. Um, your it's it translated here as your limbs, like your bones. Kadesha tifrachena will flourish, what does it say? Flourish. The perach is a flower. So this is Isaiah's vision for the return. And so most fitting, even though in Ashkenazi tradition, we've harnessed it to uh, the Shabbat Rosh Chodesh. It fits beautifully for this seven weeks that we're in right now. Okay, and then just to continue the, the I don't know, the unpacking of the tradition, here's a little piece from the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch. So I don't, I, don't, I think maybe we've only grabbed texts from the Shulchan Aruch a few times in these sessions. This is the central code of Jewish law. When we talk about the codes, we talk about the Shulchan Aruch, the Kitsur meaning um, abbreviated, Kitsur is like shortened. So this is a, a, one of many attempts to take the massive code of Jewish law and distill it into things that um, regular people like us can absorb and digest as a process that's been unfolding for many hundreds of years. So here's what the Kitsur Shulchan Aruch says. Mishabbat shelachar tisha ba'av ulahan, he says, uh, starting with the Shabbat after tisha ba'av and going forward. Maftirin b'sheva shabbatot shiva denechemata. You can see it here. It's just wonderful to see, you know, the original sources for these things. We complete the, the ritual readings with these readings of consolation, the seven weeks of consolation. Except, it says, v'imchal alef de Rosh Chodesh elul b'Shabbat, if it happens that the first day of Rosh Chodesh elul, there it is, is on Shabbat, dochin onia soara, it says. We push away the opening phrase of the traditional third week of the Haftarah, umaftirin hashamayim kisi, and instead we make the Haftarah into this special one for Shabbat Rosh Chodesh, which begins, uh, the heavens are my throne, speaking in the voice of God. Mipnei sheyesh ba'gam ken 
Menachamot Yerushalayim, because this special Shabbat Rosh Chodesh Haftara also mentions Nechama. And I am guessing that this is what he's talking about, this passage from Shabbat Rosh Chodesh, which will come to that word, Nechama, over and over again. So I just, uh, I love it when I can, you know, excavate, oh, where does this tradition come from? And are we supposed to push aside this reading for that one? Yes, indeed. And there's some logic here that we're, we're not meant to throw aside the whole practice of the seven, the seven weeks, but in fact, to continue to, um, to practice it, to be in this unique seven week period where we continue to, to bring ourselves comfort, which is I think to say, to bring ourselves encouragement, inspiration, to nourish that sense of hope and uh, vision of the future that sometimes gets discouraged in the, the course of the year. Okay, now, because we're not gonna see the, oh, go ahead, Michael, what were you gonna say? Uh, just just a question. Uh, the, the text says that um, we set aside for the Haftorah uh, for Elul. Does that mm -hmm. mean that, all, that that's a special one and that if Shabbos happens to fall on uh, the first day of the month, the rest of the year, there's something else that you read? Well, um, it's saying for Elul because the seven weeks of comfort fall, they, they overlap with the arrival of Elul. Yes, so but you would, would we read that Haftorah if it were Adar. Yes. If it if it's Shabbat Rosh Chodesh Adar, okay. you so read there the... Isn't, there isn't a special Rosh Chodesh uh, for Shabbos El, uh, Elul. Correct, correct. It's okay. just the regular, correct, you're right. It's the regular monthly Shabbat Rosh Chodesh Haftarah. Yes, great. Thank you for making the clarification. Okay. Just so we don't lose it, because we're not going to hear the, the traditional third haftarah of comfort, I just want us to see a little bit of it here. It begins, as we just saw in the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, it says you push away, where's the language? Onia Soara. And so here it is. This is what we won't be hearing this Shabbat. It, the haftarah begins by God responding to Israel. Remember, in the second week, Israel says, I am lost and I am, uh, I am, uh, I'm lost. I, I, I'm, go ahead, Luther, you have something better. No, I probably don't because I'm not, I'm not familiar with what you are I have to go back and put it in front of us. I'm just, it's just not coming to me now. But the, remember how we, we've talked about this a few times that you can look at these seven weeks as a conversation back and forth between God and Israel. And the second week, Israel said, after God starts out saying, Nachamu, Nachamu, I think we talked about this last week, Israel's second week says, ah, I'm not buying it. I, I, I'm feeling kind of overwhelmed and, and not very uh, hopeful here. So the third week, the, in, through Isaiah, the voice comes back saying, okay, I hear that this is where you are. You are uh, impoverished and like, uh, Storm tossed, as the as the translation is giving giving us. Lo nuchama. See this here. You're not comforted, even though I've tried to tell you that everything's going to be okay. So, God continues again in the voice of Isaiah. Hine anochi marbitz bapuch avanaich. I'm going to lay foundation stones for you. I'm going to help strengthen you, and so that you won't feel so ill at ease or unsure or untrusting. Visadataich basapirim. And in fact, once I lay those foundation stones, I'm going to um, adorn them with sapphires. And we could make a whole thing about what, what color are sapphires? They're blue. And what does blue often mean in our tradition? Heaven, a connection with God. This came up when we were learning about the tzitziot and the tradition of putting the thread of blue in the tzitzit, and that, in, at least according to some rabbinic commentaries, that blue is meant to help us. Oh yes, we're connected with heaven here. Uh, so just, just it's just beautiful imagery. V'samki kad kod shim shotaich 
Usha'arayich la'avnei ekdach. Just look at what, what's coming up here. So we have sapphires. I will make your, uh, your structures out of rubies, your gates of precious stones. I don't know if you remember last week, the bit of Isaiah that we looked at described how Israel was going to be a bride dressed for the chuppah. It's the same sort of language coming up here. You're going to be cherished and beloved and glowing with beauty. Okay, just, there isn't really a lot of, I actually looked to see if anybody had any commentary about this and nobody seems to amazingly, or at least not that I could find. And I think it's just for the beauty of it. It's, um, it's there isn't any sort of secret meaning to it, or at least not that I discovered. Okay, but then one more piece from Isaiah from what would have been the, th the third week Haftarah that we won't be hearing, which is to try to connect us with what I want to look at with you for Parashat Re'e this week, which is all about food, as we'll see in a moment. Once again, the prophet here uses the language of food to reassure us, to reassure his listeners of a future of plenty, a future of nourishment, a future of health and vitality. And I'm, um, I was interested in this because last Shabbat, we were in Parashat Ekev, and we talked about how in, in the synagogue, for anybody who was there while I was in the middle of having a coughing fit, which I thankfully overcame, uh, we talked about how last Shabbat was the proof text for Birkat HaMazon. Ve'achelta ve'savata uverachta. You will eat, you will be satisfied, and you will bless. And a lot of language in the Haftarah itself about how we have grown from being a community that um, subsisted, or I guess nourished, were nourished on manna, to a community that's going to come into its own land and have a relationship with that land and produce food for itself. And I, I'm, Debbie, I can't help but look at you and you know remind myself that we have a an agricultural expert right in our midst right now. So, okay, so just to, to finish up with Isaiah here, Isaiah says in this week's Haftarah, this is how you're going to know that redemption is at hand. Let's just see a little bit of this language. Kol lechulemaim, all of you who are thirsty, come forward now to water. Come, come have something to drink. Uh, Lehu shivru ve'echolu, ulehu shivro below chesef, uvelo machir, yain vechalav. There's going to be plenty of wine and milk for you. And remember, these were would have been staples for the, the time that we're talking about. Uh, I wanted to just get down here. Ve'ichlu tov, ve'tit anag, badeshen nafshechem. You're going to eat well, and ta'aneg, uh, titaneg, from the same word as oneg, to really feel, wow, this is just, I don't know, oneg, uh, like, oneg is connected to food. When we say oneg Shabbat, it's because we're eating something usually. Like, there's other ways that we rejoice on Shabbat, but the idea of oneg, I think, is connected specifically to culinary joy, so to speak. Um, okay, so just holding on to this imagery of how Isaiah wants us to imagine our return to the land and to a place of, of nourishment. Um, I'm reading this with you and thinking also of Lamentations. In the book of Lamentations, I don't have it memorized, but there are several places in Lamentations that talk about the absence of food that when disaster comes, one of the ways you know it's really coming um, is that you, you don't have anything to eat. In fact, Lamentations goes all the way to the extreme of describing cannibalism because people are so hungry. So whew, we don't have to be in that place right now. Okay, so hence the title, what's for dinner? <laughs> okay, let's look now at Parashat Re'e. So I have a kind of a longish segment just to read through together, um, which is one of the foundation segments or foundation set of verses that informs 
the laws of kashrut. Could I ask for a reader in English here? It's, this is mostly for the pleasure of just hearing the lengths that the Torah goes to, to see all these different kinds of things that it wants us to know specifically we can or can't eat. Debbie, do you, would you be willing to read this? Just don't forget to unmute. There. Okay, you shall not eat anything abhorrent. These are the animals that you may eat, the ox, the sheep and the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roebuck, the wild goat, the ibex, the antelope, the mountain sheep, and any other animal that has true hoofs, which are cleft in two and brings up the cud, such you may eat. But the following, which do bring up the cud or have true hoofs, which are cleft for you may not eat. The camel, the hare, and the demon, I don't you know that is. For although they bring up the cud, they have no true hoofs, they are impure for you. Also the swine, for although it has true hoofs, it does not bring up the cud, it is impure for you. You shall not eat of their flesh or touch their carcasses. These you may eat of all that live in water. You may eat anything that has fins and scales. But you may not eat anything that has no fins and scales. It is impure for you. You may eat any pure bird. The following you may not eat. The eagle, the vulture, and the black vulture. The kite, the falcon, and the buzzard of any variety. Every variety of raven the ostrich, the nighthawk, the seagull, and the hawk of any variety, the little owl, the great owl, and the white owl, the pelican, the bustard, and the cormorant, the stork, any variety of heron, the hoopoe, and the bat. All winged swarming things are impure for you. They may not be eaten. You may eat only pure winged creatures. You shall not eat anything that has died a natural death. Give it to the stranger in your community to eat, or you may sell it to a foreigner. For you are a people consecrated to your God, uh, uh, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Kol HaKavod. Thank you. And by the way, I didn't, I didn't know why, the, I don't even know how to pronounce this. Damen or Damen. The, the, bat mitz, the B mitzvah child is speaking on Shabbat and will explain to us about a uh, she pronounces it Damon. Um, she did the research, so call a kavod to her. So first of all, just to take in, again, the level of detail that the text goes into to differentiate from all these different kinds of creatures and to give us um, the beginning of what would become a full rabbinic treatise, of course, on what we can eat and what we can eat and why. Um, from a from a uh, biological standpoint or from a physical standpoint. Why? If it brings up the cud and it has split hooves or not is how we differentiate. The question, I guess, I was going to say is really why? Like, why does it matter whether it has a split hoof? Um, and I think that's one of the things I was hoping to talk with you about today. Kind of this question of you are what you eat. So if you eat something that is um, a bottom feeder, you are likely not only to be vulnerable to probably things that aren't good for you to put in your body, um, but what are you saying about yourself? What, what, is that, what will that turn into you as a person morally? I think that's where the rabbis pick up the, the baton here and say there's a moral question. It's not just, um, it's, it's not just, proper food handling. So let me stop the share for a minute. I do have some commentaries I want to look at with you. But I'm, I'm just curious to pause with you for a minute and ask you if anybody would be willing to share about their own kashrut practices, and especially if they've evolved over the years. Uh, so uh, go ahead, Bob. Great. Well, I have, um, I have two kashrut um, traditions. Uh, one is from my father and grandfather, and the others from my son. Mm. My father and grandfather were um, classic reform Jews. I was taught that um, uh, keeping kashrut was really a uh, technique to help us remember to be good people. And what we should do is not keep kashrut, but um, concentrate on being good people. So my grandfather taught me how to eat lobster and crab and shellfish and all of that. 
And so when I don't eat kashrut when I'm with my twin brother, I don't eat kosher, then I'm honoring my father and my grandfather. On the other hand, my son um, and uh, um, um, other relatives keep kosher. And so I can keep kosher by keeping kosher or by following the kashrut of my um, father and grandfather, which is not to keep kosher. I have two separate traditions that uh -huh. I call on when I need to. Okay, great. I guess I'm curious, um, you said a minute ago, you were taught that keeping kosher is to help us remember to be good people. Is that how you put it? Or yeah, we, we were we were taught that all of the um, rituals in Judaism were really reminders about the ethical pronouncements. And what we ought to really mm -hmm. do is concentrate on being re really careful about ethical uh, behavior. And if we if we concentrate on that and learned about that, mm -hmm. then keeping the uh, rituals was now anachronistic. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not being taught so that way now, but in my childhood, it was that, you know, you don't have to keep kosher. You don't have to, you know, follow rules for Shabbat. Um, you don't have to, you know, follow ritual. You um, uh, need to think about the ethical rules of Judaism and follow those um, uh, with great um, accuracy. And that's what mm -hmm. Judaism is. Precision. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So thank you. Probably you all are familiar, or maybe you're familiar with the early reform movement, which um, I'm going to get the year wrong. I think it was very early in the 20th century. I don't think it was in the 19th century. Or very early in the 20th century, 19th century. at the, the Pittsburgh. Somebody is remembering this. Debbie, are you saying? Yeah, yeah, I think the, I think the Pittsburgh platform. The late 19th century. Oh, late 19th century. The, 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 the banquet century. of Ed, we're talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's nice. um, it was the 19th century. Okay. This, so some of you know what I'm talking about and jump in here. Uh, a, a convention of reform rabbis who openly um, pushed aside the, the practice of kosher. In fact, dined on a meal of shrimp cocktail, as the story goes, at their convention, sort of along the same lines as what Bob is saying. Like the purpose of our religious tradition here is not to turn us into, you know, um, uh, I, I was going to say, you know, sort of obsessive compulsive followers of halakha, but to stay connected with the core teachings of ethical behavior in the world. And really, honestly, how does avoiding a piece of shrimp make any difference in how I behave towards my neighbors or lobster, as Bob was saying? Um, 1883. Debbie, are you, is that you? Yeah. Go ahead, Shlomo. Yeah, I, I think one of the important things for me, anyhow, is this notion that a human being can't have everything he wants at any time. Mm -hmm. So there's certain things you can't eat. Mm -hmm. And I think every once in a while, it's important for us to have that experience mm -hmm. that uh, at least traditionally, I don't know how many of us actually abide by it, mm -hmm. but you know, you can't have everything you want whenever you want it. And mm -hmm. I think that's that's an important underlying mm -hmm. idea here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't want to get into it too much, but I disagree with the translation of Lo Tevashel Gedi Bechalevi Mo, and I think it's fat, not milk. Ah, okay. Shale. We're going to come back to that. We're going to come back to that in a minute. So, so hold on. That was Shlomo's pointing to what Debbie was reading right at the end of the the segment that we looked at from Parsa, right? Great. Okay. Hold on to that. Anybody else? Just personal. Go ahead, Mark. So neither Marilyn or I grew up uh, in kosher home, uh, but we belong to Fubrangan community, Avara, uh, here in Washington. And uh, that's how we met through that group. And a number of people kept kosher. And I think we were motivated to feel more part of that community. And we decided uh, that when our, uh, that after we got married, that we would try to try to keep kosher. And we did our practices were to have and remain 
have separate uh, separate dishes, mm -hmm. uh, not to eat uh, at home, not to eat uh, milk and meat together. Separate those. When we go out, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> we uh, don't eat shellfish, don't eat pork. Um, mm -hmm. We do eat um, milk and meat, um, and it's it's been meaningful for us. We're not, we're a little bit lax. But we're, um, what we try, um, <laughs> we, we used our dishwasher, dishwasher separately for meat and for milk until uh, the Tushmans told us that they don't, and uh, that that was liberating for us. Uh -huh. And I and I I think it's been important in two respects, and it's felt good to be part of the community. And I think maybe the most important thing is. Uh, Without being oppressive, I think it's been very good for transmitting Judaism to our children. We have mm -hmm. not been very for forceful, but I, uh, you know, and demanded that they marry Jewish women or, or anything like that. But I think it's been very good for trans transmitting uh, mm -hmm. Judaism to the next mm -hmm. generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think I was thinking about this last week as well with the, the text we were in last week and on Shabbat, just the idea that the, the practice of kashrut puts the question of Judaism in front of you, literally in your mouth, every time you eat. So as, as um, Mark is saying, it's a way to, it's a very visceral, you know, concrete way of transmitting a tradition. It's much easier to explain than, you know, theology, for instance. So uh, um, even if we may have our own versions of kashrut or may have, have uh, put it aside altogether in, in, the, in a traditional sense, it's a valuable tool for transmitting Jewish identity. Okay, last comment from Steve, and then we'll go back to our sheet. So I, I can't help but um, uh, recount my first exposure to Rabbi Ira of blessed memory. And, um, you know, looking at him and thinking, oh, here's a very traditional old rabbi, you know, with the, he looks, look traditional. And, and we were at a, I think maybe it was in a Dutchville retreat or a gathering about kashrut. Mm -hmm. And I remember him railing against the, you know, how people have become divided over kashrut and couldn't family members mm. not come together and mm -hmm. be together in each mm -hmm. other's homes because of their um, automaton dedication to following or not following. And, um, mm -hmm. I remember thinking, ah, you know, here's, I, I feel at home in this, in mm -hmm. this discussion. Um, and, and, you know, now I have a, a sister who's Lubavitch, so when we go there, it's very, you know, there's the whole different sets of plates and all that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we go, we would go, this is when my parents were still alive, that's where we would go for a celebration because then everybody could be comfortable. Um, where, however, it, it would trouble me um, to think that she couldn't come to my house, although mm -hmm. she would bring, you know, for her young son when he was young, she would bring um, food that he could eat. Um, so um, uh, it, I grew up. Basically, you know, we didn't have pork products, um, but there weren't two separate dishes. It mm -hmm. probably was done at the grandparents' level, but certainly not in my household. Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. we didn't even have a, we didn't have room for two separate dishes, but, mm. but we didn't do that. Um, uh, so I just wanted to share that. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this, this memory of Rabbi Ira and his, uh, his critique of the way some practice kashrut and letting it get in the way of of being with loved ones makes me think of uh in so in our house i'm sure that my husband jonathan was a mashkiach in another life because even though he does not have credentials now it's something that's very important to him um and from day one his practice was i keep my kind of kashrut in my home but I will eat whatever my siblings are serving. So if we're going to the family for a meal, and and we you know we expect that they won't serve us lobster salad, but 
Uh, but if they want to make a chicken and that's what they're serving, we're not going to stand on ceremony. So I, I always thought that was, um, I th that made me comfortable. Okay, there's more to that story for another time. Uh, but let's go back to our source sheet. Okay. So let, let's go here, first of all, to the famous ending. Um, look with me, starting at verse 21. Lo tochlu chol nevela lager asher bisharecha titnena v'achala o mechor lenochri ki am kodesh ata ladonai elohecha. So you're not supposed to, I mean, we could focus on verse 21, but in other words, of all these things, you're not supposed to eat certain things and you can eat other things. Why? Ki am kadosh ata. Sorry, I mispronounced it. Am kadosh. And it's interesting, I just noticed it's am um, is the singular. You are a holy people. Um, it's the fact that it's rendered in the singular gives it a different feel. Um, am kadosh ata, not uh, anashim kadoshim atem, something like that. So the fact that it's we're one, and we have this particular relationship with the Creator, and one of the ways we honor that relationship is by abiding by certain rules about what we eat. And then finally, lo tevashel gedi b'chalev imo. You will not cook uh, a kid, a, a baby animal in its mother's milk. And Shlomo, um, do you want to jump in here and just say more about your, you think this is, we should read this chalev as, not as milk, but as like milk Chalev. fat, basically. Yeah. Yeah, the word... This, this could take a few minutes, but the word, chet, the letters, chet lamid vet, chelev mm -hmm. uh, is a word which means fat, and it mm -hmm. occurs a zillion times in the book of Vayikra when we are mm -hmm. talking about our sacrifices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when I first really got interested in this, I was trying to figure out what is the value of not cooking a kid in its mother's milk? Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I've heard people say, but I would like to really see the reference, is that this is to separate us from those around us who cooked meat in milk or something like that. Mm -hmm. But that, I, I, don't, I don't know if that's really accurate or not. And so I couldn't find in this phrase a value that satisfied me. When I looked at it as don't cook a kid in its mother's fat, I asked, what has to happen to the mother if you're going to cook the kid in its fat? Mm -hmm. And you have to kill the mother in order to uh -huh. have the fat to kick. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the only other mitzvah besides honor your parents, which promises long life, mm -hmm. it's going to be in a couple chapters, chapter 22 in the Varim. Yeah. If you come upon a bird's nest. Yes. And the mother of the bird is protecting the nestlings or the mm -hmm. eggs mm -hmm. before you take the nestlings or the eggs chase the mother away yeah so that no harm comes to the mother right and that whole section in 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 dvarim on chapter 22 ends lo tikach aim al habanim mm -hmm. you should not take a mother with its offspring yes and yes. that supports the translation of this as don't cook a kid in its mother's fat. Mm -hmm. But in addition, in Vayikra in chapter 22, we have something which says you should not kill the son of a bull on the same okay. day. Uh-huh, okay. And so I see the value here as protection of species, of protection uh -huh. of natural life. Mm -hmm. And that rings, that, that stays with me much more. The only thing I would say is if we actually do accept this as don't cook a kid in its mother's milk, I would ask why poultry and milk is not kosher. Because okay, I, well, yeah. I don't know of any chickens or turkeys <laughs> that are providing milk for their young. Right. But I, right, I happen right. to think, I think it's a serious mistranslation of thousands of years ago. Not that I expect any changes in the Jewish tradition but I think this is protection of the species. There's two supporting places in Torah 
to support the translation as fat rather than milk. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Okay, so that's enough about that. No, it's great. Thank you. I was thinking also of that same part in, in Ki Tetze that you just mentioned, where it says the thing you mentioned, if you come upon a bird and its offspring, you can take the offspring, you can take the eggs if you want, but you have to make sure the mother goes free. And uh, this thing that if you if you translate it as Shlomo is saying, you cannot cook a kid in its mother's fat, you have to kill the parent in order to, to do that. Whereas if you cook it in its mother's milk, you don't, you can just take the milk. So thank you. What an interesting uh, alternative reading. And boy, that opens up whole worlds for things like cheeseburgers. So I don't know. I mean, you might be onto something here. Um, well, well okay. can I can I make one more? Yeah. Kind of irreverent comment. Mm -hmm. So I hope there's nobody terribly insulted by this. It, it's kind of a joke. But I made up a bracha for eating a cheeseburger. Ah. Which is Baruch Ata Hamefarve Mat Ame Basar Vichalav, who makes every milk and meat dish parve. Mefarve. <laughs> right. Mefarve. Thank you. Great, great, great. Okay. I know some people who might like to have that on hand. Um, great, thank you. Okay, I see some hands up. So I'm gonna go first to Audrey. I'm just going in people who haven't said anything yet. No. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Mm -hmm. This line, because it's the last line, even after for you are people consecrated to your God, like you feel like yeah. that should be the end. And yeah. then, oh, by the way, you shall not boil. So can you add any help in why this would be the last sentence? Is it meant to? Yeah, it it's, like, it's, it's a good observation. Minute? Yeah. I, right. I mean, who knows the real answer, but, and I'll, I'll share what comes to mind for me and maybe others have an, a different answer. Right, it's like, wow, you go through this whole litany and then you end with a sort of a more grand theological statement, ki am kadosh ata, and you think, okay, it's all settled. And then why is this now added in? And I was gonna say, I think a reason at least is that it's not the first time we see that phrase in Torah. It comes up earlier, it comes up in, um, in Exodus, I believe twice in Exodus. And I think that my take is that when the Torah was being compiled into five books and they wanted to sell it to us as five books, they wanted to make sure that Devarim uh, would echo or connect back to something that was more basic, more um, primary, uh, you know, primordial from, from Exodus, which is the, you know, the ancestral story. So it's, um, it's like saying, see all this list of all these different animals and look at how many different species and specific subspecies we've mentioned here but it all comes back to do not boil a kid in its mother's milk which we have we are now in deuteronomy reaffirming that was pre-stated in exodus so that's the answer i would give um gil do you are you about this or something else well, two things. First of all, yes, that makes sense because that's a lot of what happens in Deuteronomy. There's an echo of things that come before. Yeah. Um, like I think Shlomo said, somebody said, you know, it's this is about limiting what we can eat. But what I want mm -hmm. to bring up, the next topic is tithing, masrot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The very next thing that we talk about is how you would give part of what you gather, bring it to Jerusalem Back. or wherever. Mm -hmm. And this is to start with a way of telling you what you can and cannot tithe among your animals. Mm. And also, well, just the juxtaposition, because the juxtapositions mm -hmm. are very important in these yes. texts. Mm -hmm. And bringing the milk and meat thing is, I think, just realized it's also that you can't tithe, you can't enjoy yourself that much by eating, you know, killing, killing your animal and eating it, eating it with the mother's milk. You're, that's mm -hmm. a limitation. You cannot do that as part of the tithing is supposed to be an act of joy and happiness. Mm. You have a limit to what you can do. And that's what this is all about is limitations. You have to have some self-control. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not gonna, you're not gonna have self-control well with grains or wine. I mean, in terms of what you bring, but animals, you, these are the animals you can bring. This is what you can eat out of those animals. This is yes. how you do it. Yes. And there is a reason these are next to each other. Mm -hmm. There's always a reason things are next to each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So. Thank you. Um, Steve and Michael, you both have your hands up, but I didn't know if you still have them up from before or you have something else you want to say. 
So I guess oh, this is Steve. I will I will just say that um, I always not really understanding this uh, this phrase uh, the boil the kid in the mother's milk. Uh, literally, I I just always internalized as as a metaphor for humanity, uh, mm -hmm. and that this is respect for life, mm -hmm. and you should not basically par to paraphrase, not to uh, to kill a child in in the in the view of or in the presence of its parent. You know, mm -hmm. so just be more humane and not do it at the same time you know, they, yeah. don't, don't do don't do that so that's, yes that's how it spoke to me great thank you hang on because we're going to be looking in a minute at some commentaries which i think will corroborate what you're saying michael did you have something else you wanted yeah to say? I, I, I this actually fits with what steve said i'm going back mm -hmm. in memory more than 60 years ago because this uh, mm -hmm. question came up in the orthodox talmud torah mm. the question that Shlomo raised is maybe it means the other. And the rabbi taught that, no, this, if you, if you read it literally, it is up kid in its possessive mother's milk. Mm -hmm. And that to do as Shlomo suggests, says you shouldn't, you kill, you kill the mother, you kill the child mm -hmm. in order to get the result. Mm -hmm. This says, as Steve pointed out, you have to kill the child. You have to kill. Um, you have to kill the child in the presence of the mother, and that's a whole ethical problem. Mm -hmm. and that's what it's all about. It's the ethics of uh, of of this kind of thing. Now, how mm -hmm. that got extended to milk and meat across everything, right, is a whole discussion, or maybe a semester in in Talmud Torah. Yeah, but well, let's this little piece taken literally is a question of the ethics uh, very much as as uh, I'm sorry, as Bob had pointed out. Excellent. Thank you. Let's look right now at. Um, OK, no, I want to skip that. OK, let's look at a little bit of classical text, which looks at the this very phrase we've been talking about and then at one of the answers to the chicken question. Okay, so here in Rashi, first of all, Lo Tiva Shel Gedi, he's commenting on this exact phrase. Shalosh Pamim Prat Lechaya Ule Ofot Ule Vehema Tmea. So he says three times the prohibition of seething meat in, its, in milk is mentioned in the Torah, as we were saying before, twice in Exodus, and each time in the form of Lo Tiva Shel Gedi. Bechalav imo, thus excluding three species, he says, the wild beast, fowls, and unclean beasts from the prohibition. So he's saying there, there's some room to work around here. And it's not only, it's not to all mammals. And notice that he says, fowl is maybe given an exemption. This is Rashi speaking. You know, I, my, my little irreverent voice is saying, of course, because he was a vintner and he wanted to be able to serve a nice piece of fowl with his choicest, you know, Sauvignon Blanc or something. I don't know. Okay, now let's go forward in time a little bit to Ramban. And um, I think there was, yeah, he's, he's actually going to quote Rashi, this thing, the thing we just looked at. So he's also um, looking at the same thing and at this phrase that we've highlighted before, ki am kadosh ata ladonai elohecha. Why are you not supposed to do this, all these things, or follow these uh, boundaries? Because you are, you have a specific relationship of kedusha. And then he says, the purport um, of connecting lo tevashel gidi b'chalavimo im, with ki, im, ki am kadosh ata, uh, although it is not an abhorrent food, for both milk and meat are permitted separately, you can have a glass of milk and you can also have a hamburger if you want, but not together. Um, he prohibited it because we are holy in foods, in our choice of foods, as Shlomo was saying and others were saying, that we can't have everything we want because we ourselves are holy, that we not become a cruel people that is not compassionate by milking the mother and extracting its milk to see therein its kid. So it's just what some of you have been saying, that this must go back to some commitment to compassionate living, 
um, not only for other human beings, but for animals. And although any meat cooked in milk is included in this prohibition, uh, even though it is not in its own mother's milk, a situation without apparent cruelty, nevertheless, it is forbidden because any nursing animal is called mother and any suckling offspring is called kid. And if they are together in the process of cooking, there is an element of cruelty in all cases, whether a kid is in its own mother's milk or not. Okay, so Ramban is saying part of the reason we extend this rule across, you know, across the species um, is not, uh, it's to save us from ever putting a child and a parent in the same, <laughs> in the same cauldron, so to speak. Just as we as human beings, if, of course, if it was our own child who was being harmed, we're, we can't possibly watch that or, or stand for that. But even another child, uh, we wouldn't want to be harmed. So it's acknowledging that even in the animal kingdom, there is this um, irrepressible connection between the parents' generation and the kids' generation, quite literally. Okay, so that's an interesting um, explanation of how the the Kashrut code comes to be so um, uh, generalized and so ingrained. Okay, I'm going to skip over this. He's actually just, okay. Now look at this. This is a famous passage from the beginning of Pirkei Avot. And I put this in here because it's often taught as the principle on which a lot of the Kashrut laws are developed. Is from the opening, Vasu Sayag la Torah, make a fence around the Torah. Gader Shaloya Vo Liga Beisur Torah, Kagon Shniot la Arayot, Ushvut le Shabbat. So make a hedge, make a fence, make a border in order that he not come into contact with Torah prohibitions, it says, and then the Pirkei goes into examples like sexual relationships. Um, etc., or uh, rabbinic fences to protect the Shabbat. So we, we say we're not allowed to do things on Shabbat, cause, not because those, th those things themselves are prohibited, but that if we were allowed to do those things, they might open the way for us to do the things we actually are prohibited from. So this is the principle behind, for instance, prohibiting, considering poultry as meat. As Shlomo said, and as we know, Fowl do not produce milk. They're not mammals. They don't nurse their young. So what's the problem of having, you know, chicken parmesan, for instance? Shouldn't be any problem. But the Torah says, and the tradition, the rabbinic tradition says, you actually want to make an extra effort, make an extra protection around the law. So if the law is do not boil a kid in its mother's milk, because chicken, cooked chicken, could appear like meat, it's easy to get them mixed up in the same meal. It's easy to mistake. Let's just make it clear. There's no way you can ever have anything that either is meat or looks like meat with milk. And it goes back to, among others, what Ramban is saying. Why don't we want to ever cook anything in any kind of meat in, in milk? not only because it might be its mother's milk, but because we recognize there's, um, uh, I was gonna say a humanity in the animal kingdom. That's a confusing way of talking, but a, a kind of natural order of things, even among animals. And we don't want to ever put animals in a position we as human beings wouldn't wanna be in. Um, okay, I wanna come to one last thing, which is here. So let's see if I can find it. Yeah, verse 18. Vachasida va anafa lemina. So the stork and any variety of heron and the hoopoe and the bat. Okay, those are things that we are supposed to be aware of in our, in our awareness of what we eat. And actually, let's go this way first. So this is. Um, from the current chief rabbi of the United Kingdom. And would anybody read this for us in the English? Um, Gil, would you read this? 
But don't don't forget to unmute. We can't hear you. One of the birds that is featured on the list is the chasida, the stork. The Gemara in Masechet Chulin tells us that the stork is called chasida because it is righteous and because it is selfless. It is an exceptionally kind bird. Okay, but pause there... for a second. So I did pull up the, the, the reference from Chulin here, from the Talmud. Amar Rab Yehuda, ha-chasida zo daya levana lemanikra shema chasida she'ose chasidut im chaverotav. Chavarotea, excuse me. Why do we call the stork a chasida? Because it does chesed. It performs acts of loving kindness, basically. It towards, they translate it here as charity, chasidut, towards its fellows. Okay, so that's the reason that the stork is singled out here. And now let's go back to the chief rabbi. Go ahead. Uh, there is Gil. a problem because the Rambam tells us that there is a common denominator among all birds which are not kosher. He tells us that they have a cruel streak in their nature and some of them are outrightly birds of prey. So how is it possible, therefore, that the chasida, this pious stork, is actually treif? The Chidushe Harim, the founder of the Hasidic sect of Gur in the 19th century, gives a beautiful explanation. He tells us that the chasida, the stork, is indeed selfless and kind-hearted, however, only to birds of its own feather. Towards other birds and other creatures, it acts cruelly and disdain. As a result, it is not kosher. The Chidushe Harim tell, goes on to tell us that the laws of Kashrut in our Parsha do not only relate to what we can and cannot eat, but they tell us, also tell us about ourselves. We shouldn't lead a stork-like existence. In the event of, that our compassion and selflessness extends only to those within our own limited social clique, those within our own echo chamber, then ultimately, that is a traif form of existence. In order to be kosher, we, we ourselves need to recognize the image of God within the soul of every human being and to reach out with kindness towards one and all. Kol hakavod. Thank you. Where did you get, the, where is that quote from exactly? It's from the, the website of the chief rabbi, the rabbi. of England. Okay. Yeah, I, I put the, uh, I put the, whatchamacallit, you know, the URL there. And I can, I can send that. I haven't made these source sheets public, which I guess I could do. So Debbie, I see you. Hang on one second. So this is, this is actually a teaching that Rabbi Fred has shared with us, I think a couple of times when we've come to this part of the Torah. It's a beautiful teaching. And it just comes back to this thing that we've been sort of touching on for the whole last hour, which is that what we are what we eat and we, what we put in our mouths actually helps form who we are as people. And that's part of why we go to the trouble to observe whatever form of kashrut we observe. It's not so much, I mean, forgive me, Orthodox colleagues and friends, but it's not so much whether we are precise in this or that animal, but that we pay attention and recognize, as Shlomo said, that we can't always have what we want and that we want what we do put in our mouths to reflect the people that we're trying to be. Debbie, go ahead. So just two quick observations. Um, first is, I was just really conscious this time as he went through the budget list, uh, because I was reading it, of the connection between scavenging and mm. the prohibited species. Um, mm -hmm. And with that, of course, the connection with death, or unnatural death. So you have mm. buzzards, and you have vultures, and you have two kinds of vultures, and you have different hawks and different types of uh, birds in particular that are mm -hmm. really associated with being around dead puppies. Um, so mm -hmm. not all of them come into that category, but there's, it seems on the, on the surface to be very interesting, uh, even if it's not explicitly stated. What, is, what are those connections? And like I say, and looking at the seabirds, definitely, a, like I say, scavenging. Mm -hmm. Anything in their sight, as we all know from seagulls at the beach. Um, mm -hmm. So. I don't know what that means, but just thought it was sort of interesting to look at. The second is about the issue of compassionate, and you know, I've, I've long uh, been sorry that the, the whole eco kashrut movement hasn't really taken on uh, mm -hmm. more influence, um, and there are a variety of reasons for that. But you know, it, it, I appreciate your comments about letter of the law because I immediately think about. You know the Hasidic folks that went to Iowa and opened beef processing plants, and then had 
all kinds of serious labor issues, and if anyone's familiar with the post of, of the book, um, you know, it came up maybe 10 years ago. It's, it's you know, it, but again, it's, if it's good enough for, you know, our group, that's fine, and we don't really care about the, the foreigners, the outsiders. We don't care mm -hmm. about the migrant workers that we're exploiting, mm -hmm. we don't mm -hmm. care about the quality, and we certainly have seen uh, during the pandemic and the supply chain issues, what that can mean in terms of abuse to workers in mm -hmm. a, a pro meat processing setting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so much attention there to the, the species, but so little attention, of course, that we give to the people that actually make the food available. Right. Right, and right. I so... find it, I mean, you know, most cases in my neighborhood, pretty much. So I go there, like quality. But honestly, you know, I, I think, do I go to Mom's and get my meat from the producers that I know and trust and I think have decent labor values, or decent mm -hmm. environmental values, or do I go to the kosher store? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, not always. No, it's a real question. It's a real question. And it's one I know I've, I've asked in our house, too. Uh, and I don't, I don't have a good answer. Well, um, I wouldn't expect you to, but I just think it's so, I think in our current context, when we think about kashrut, we think about the principles. And, you yeah. know, I, I think we just need to sort of broaden our perspective a bit. Amen. Um, thank you. Thank you for all of that. Uh, there's, there's a lot more to say here. I'm aware that we need to wrap up. I just want to end by coming back to the... Birkat Hamazon, and I've been thinking about this English version that we've chanted many times at the synagogue, which is just based on that passage from last week's parasha, Ve'achalta, Ve'savata, Uverachta, you will eat, you will be satisfied, and you will bless. And it's in the blessing that we hold on also to that need to be aware, to tie our, our primal need to eat, which is part of our biological drive, with our higher aspirations for ourselves as human beings. So Hannah Tiferet Siegel in her version ends by saying, we share in a vision of wholeness and release where every child is nourished and we all live in peace. So from our mouths, literally, to all of our ears and let's say to God's ears, that our, our food intake could help us also be aware of our potential as human beings. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. It was always great to be with all of you and I hope to see you very soon. Keep well and Ute Avon. <laughs>